Welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm also Dave Nutt's driver. Um, he's, he's appropriately on, got top billing here. I should probably, like he just said, the smaller font and below him should be, uh, should be where we are. Um, when, I, when I took this job back in September of 2016, one of the first things I had to do was a gap analysis across the country to see what was missing and what we needed to help drive the game forward. I had my own ideas from the sort of 10 years of research that I'd done leading up to this point, but I, I had to go around the country and get my boots on the ground in every province and territory. And, and when I landed in Saskatchewan, I saw Dave and, and his staff and got to know them a little bit and what they'd built there. And I came back and called a, a, a mentor of mine. I said, I've, I've just found my right-hand man. Um, but I'm worried that if I take him away from Saskatchewan that uh, the whole system there that he's built with his staff could crumble. Dave is very much the brains of the operation. So I'm the why and the what. And then I take that to Dave and he figures out the who, the how, and the when. Uh, so he knows a lot more about the club licensing program than anyone in the country because he's been working on it pretty much nonstop for 12 months since he started. Um, so I'm going to let him do the bulk of the talking, which is really foreign for me. If anyone knows me, that's going to be really hard. I'll probably take over and hijack Dave's presentation. But uh, I'm going to take you through a couple of slides first myself, and it starts with this one. So everything that we do at Canada Soccer is linked to our strategic plan. It's not in the strat plan, we're not doing it. And we need to hear from you guys about what you think is important at your clubs, in your parts of Ontario, in this province, across the country. This is the URL. Please go here if you haven't already done so. It takes about 90 seconds to fill out the feedback form, depending on how detailed you want to get. If you don't do this, you forfeit your right to have a say. We can do whatever we want based on the other feedback. You forfeit your right to complain. I get complaints all the time from every level of the game. And none of the people want to go and do this and fill this out because they think it's a sham. It's not a sham. We need to hear from you guys. This is your opportunity to have a voice. Use it. Take advantage. I'm going to take you through the real current reality, right? So if we're going to make change happen, the only way we can make that happen and make it work is if we look in the mirror and we're honest with ourselves. Honest with ourselves. Some of you will have seen some of these slides already. I apologize. Nobody in the room, including Dave, has seen them all because I changed the presentation this morning, uh, which I want to do. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't know that, but his slides are okay. Um, last summer, we released these five infographics. Uh, we did a survey at the end of 2016. Um, we've got about 8,000 respondents from across the country about the implementation of long-term player development. And these are the five infographics. The first one, awareness and understanding of LTPD is actually quite high. That's very good. 70% administrators, 67% of coaches, they understand it and they know what LTPD is. That's because of you guys. That's because of the work that you guys do every single day, pushing that message out about why this is important. So give yourself a pat on the back for that. Overall support is high, 75% across the major stakeholders. And it was very close in every one of the stakeholders. There are a few caveats, one of them being people don't understand why scores and standings were taken away. Right? That means we, Canada Soccer, me, myself, Dave Nutt, our department, we have to do a better job of explaining what the benefit is to the player. Because ultimately all we care about is creating the right environment for players to fall in love with soccer and stay in the game for the rest of their life. Yes, we want to produce more national team players, but we're not going to do that at the detriment of everyone. 
Those, those two things are not, you know, independent. They're linked. We can create both. A stronger base, more people playing the game across the country, and the right environment for more players for longer so they can go on and fulfill their potential in the game. Stakeholder agreement is high. These numbers are off the charts. Not over 90% with some of the key principles of long-term player development. That last one, getting kids as many touches on the ball as possible. Brilliant. This is one for all of you here who are administrators. Those organizations, the data told us, those organizations who have been most successful in implementing LTP, LTPD at the club level are those who report the highest knowledge of LTPD. So your administrators, your coaches, your technical directors have done the work and done the research. They've read the information and they're pushing that out to their membership. And that's vitally important. And this last one screams at me. 50% of our coaches cite skill as a selection criteria. Our practice in grassroots football contradicts all of the research. All of it. There is a massive growing body of research into player development. Talent identification, talent development, talent selection. All of it says that there is zero correlation, zero, between talent at 9, 10, 11, 12, and elite performance. So why do we keep doing it? We're in this vicious hamster wheel where we keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And I talk to all the technical directors and they all agree, they say, yeah, we know, Jace, but the district won't let us change the rules. Or the province does this. Or why doesn't Canada soccer do that? Our job as technical leaders is to do the right thing for our players. We have the power. You just heard John Furlong talk about it. It was brilliant. Great presentation. We are the custodians of the game, not the nine-year-olds. We have to put the right environment in place for them to fall in love with the game and to fulfill their dreams in the game. This data was taken from FIFA from about 10 years ago. We do a magnificent job of getting kids to play soccer. Back then, we're probably still around the same numbers, but back then, we were 10th in the world. 10th out of 211 FIFA nations at getting kids to register to play soccer. We don't do a good job of developing them into professional players. That percentage is woeful. This is who we're competing against in CONCACAF for the Men's and Women's World Cup qualification. The United States is twice as good as us. Twice as good as us, but because they have a population base that's 10 times ours, they've got a significantly higher number of professional players to choose from when they're selecting their national team. Wasn't that long ago where our men's national team head coach did not have a right fullback to choose to play for Canada because there was not a right fullback in the entire country playing professional soccer that was able to transition to the international game. That cannot happen cannot happen. I hear all the time about we need to be more like Iceland or Belgium or Netherlands or Spain or Italy or Portugal or Uruguay or Argentina or whoever is the flavor of the month in world soccer at that particular point in time. Why don't we just copy what they do? Let's do what Germany did. Has anybody got a half a billion dollars they can give me to invest in our system? <laughs> right? I'd love to do that. But the reality is we're not any of those countries. Someone made that point in the presentations this weekend. We are not those countries. We are Canada. We are unique. So we need our own system. But we can learn from some of those countries and we can pull out some of the best practices that they do. These are the Scandinavian countries. We're not even remotely close to any of them. Look at this tiny little minnow on the bottom here. Beat England in the European Championships, qualified for the World Cup. I think they're doing a pretty good job. These are the G20 nations. Statistically speaking, we are the worst country in the industrialized world at developing soccer players. The worst. We need to do better. You see it at the professional level. This bar graph represents number of minutes played over the last six seasons. The colored section is the number of minutes played by Canadian players. The black section, I call it the black hole of death, is minutes played by foreigners 
international players and American players. And I don't blame the MLS clubs because they desperately want to play Canadian players in the first team. Toronto FC desperately wants to field a team of 11 Canadian players. But you heard Tim Bazbachenko say, the reason we're not playing more Canadians is because they're not good enough. They have to earn it. And if they're not good enough and our system's not producing enough players that can play at that level, whose fault is that? My fault. I'm the first person to put my hand up. It's my fault. It's all of us. Every single person in this room. Toronto FC, MLS Cup champions, fantastic, brilliant. Hopefully it inspires a generation of young Canadian kids. Cut their minutes in half for Canadians from 2016 to 2017. Vancouver Whitecaps, 2012 it was 0.04% of minutes. There is actually a tiny little sliver of blue down there, but you just can't see it. We're not producing players. Our system doesn't produce players. Definition, definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. We've been doing this since I was a kid. I'd argue the system we had when I was a kid is actually better than the system we have now. Because back then, if you wanted to make it, you had to fight to make it. Now, we complain about the fact that all of our kids are entitled. Right? Kids have changed. No, they haven't. We've changed. Right? Our system super elite 10 year olds what, what's an elite 10 year old doesn't exist we're telling kids they're special they're just kids why can't we give them all opportunities those of you from a business background if this is the performance data for your company for the last 25 years and you're the ceo are you still employed this is our our ranking history now granted the fifa ranking is a little bit flawed and it's certainly going to change with the changes that are coming to CONCACAF in terms of World Cup qualifying, League of Nations. There's a new competition format coming. That's going to make a difference. But you look at the blips where we've done well. 96, last time we qualified for the Hex. Free fall. 2000, we won the Gold Cup. Dropped off after that. 2007, semifinals of the Gold Cup. Robbed by the Americans. I'm not bitter, Steph. No. Okay. I'm not bitter. Okay? This is the reality. We have to evolve. The car comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. Have we evolved as a soccer industry? I say we have a little bit. I think we have a little bit. But I had a, an animated discussion. I have a lot of animated discussions, but I had an animated discussion yesterday in the cafeteria at lunchtime with one of my colleagues. And he was talking about a problem that they're having at the regional level. 
And I swear to God, I was 10 years earlier that I was facing the same problems when I was the technical director in Oakville. I said, you realize that you're talking about the same issues that we had 10 years ago. Why can't we fix these things? Why can't we do things better? We know, we've heard all weekend from people. Mark O'Sullivan, Reed Maltby, John Furlong, Stephen Norris, all talking about how sport needs to change and evolve. And we cling to the status quo. We hang on to it for dear life. Because change is hard. I get it, it's hard. But if we go into it with the mentality that we're there for the kids, because I tell you, if I asked each one of you independently, why do you do what you do? The number one answer that I get across the country, I do it for the kids. Yeah, great. If you do it for the kids, let's put their needs ahead of yours. Their needs ahead of your, your club's needs. Their needs ahead of your academy's needs or your district's needs or your league's needs or your province's needs. Let's put the kids' needs first and build a system around what they need. CD sales are down. We're getting killed by this internet fad. How about music club? Uh, 10 CDs for Doc. We should invest in laser discs. What if we didn't have to sell CDs? If the market trend is to shift online, we should create an online platform and charge monthly subscription fees. How is that going to help us sell CDs? <laughs> Are you on the right side of change? Ask a CPA, Chartered Professional Accountants. Leonard, you'll love that. That's a CPA commercial. Okay? When I first saw this commercial, I went to my computer and I, I, I watched it again. This is the way my brain thinks. I didn't hear what she said the, the second time. I replaced it what was going through my mind. Right? So when the woman on the couch says, why don't we create an online streaming service and charge a monthly fee? I heard, well, what if the market industry trend is to move towards a holistic development system to take away early talent selection and allow more kids the opportunity to fulfill their potential. As many as possible, as long as possible, in the best environment possible, to quote Mark in the back of the room. Why don't we create that holistic environment? Why don't we stop selecting players based on chronological age and start selecting them and grouping them based on developmental needs? and give them freedom of movement in between different player pools to keep more engaged as long as possible in the best environment possible. And then the guy with the mullet and the turtleneck and the big gold chain, which is representing the collective soccer Illuminati in our country, looks back at me and says, how's that going to help us win the under eight super elite pre-rex prospect whatever program? <laughs> this is what we're faced with. This is why we have to change. This is a very real possibility. I'm telling you, if we host the World Cup in 2026, if we qualify for the World Cup on the men's side, it changes the game in our country forever. Forever. The amount of money that comes into our country, the infrastructure that comes into our country, and John Furlong spoke about it this morning, which was brilliant. It's not even about that. It's about the inspiration of an entire generation of kids. I hope that we're going to see that in a decade on the female side when the girls got to watch the Women's World Cup on home soil in 2015. I hope we see it on the men's side as well because I saw as many boys in those stadiums as I did girls. But this event dwarfs the Olympics, dwarfs the Super Bowl, any other sport. The World Cup is the single biggest sporting event on the planet. The entire world stops to watch. Our whole country will stop to watch. This is going to change the game in our country. It will. I was the very, very fortunate 16-year-old that got to play in the last national professional soccer league that we had, the old Canadian Soccer League. You look at the players, go back through the books, look at the history of that league, look at the players that came through it as teenagers and young 20-somethings. Those players form the backbone of our men's national team for the next 15 years. The success we had in 2000 was based on a bunch of teenagers and young 20-somethings got a chance to play professional soccer against men. And it was sink or swim. I would not have had a career if it wasn't for the old CSL. I wouldn't be standing here today. I don't know what I'd be doing. This is hugely important. Please get behind it. Please support it. If you have a club in your local area, Buy tickets and go support it. Our kids need a place to aspire to get to. Right? We need a league of our own. 
The club licensing program is something that Dave Nutt's been working on for a year. He knows it better than anyone. I'm going to let him talk you through it. I just walk you through the why and the what. Dave's going to talk about the who, the how, the when, and the process, which is really unique in how we're going to do this. Because this is an evolution of an idea that started a long time ago that never got finished at a national level because of all kinds of reasons. Resources, both human and financial, for us starters. Lack of a unified plan. Lack of unison. We work across the country to try and build that. This isn't our idea. We've taken all the information that we got from all the provinces and territories about what they need, what support they need, what help they need to help grow and develop the game at the grassroots level, and figured out how we can try and do this nationally. And it's evolving. But I'm going to let Dave walk you through it. Thanks, Jason. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Especially I see some uh, technical folks out there. I'm sure you'd all rather be over uh, on the turf than in here. So I uh, appreciate it. And what it tells me is this is something that's important to all of us. It's a conversation that we all want to be involved in and engaged in. And as, uh, as Jason said, we're looking for ideas. We're always open for discussions. We're always open to hear from people about what might work, what might not. You know your, your realities much better than I do, much better than Jason does. So we rely on you to be our eyes and our ears and help to inform our decisions so that we can guide the country forward. So Jason did say was, I was going to talk about the how and the who, but I'm going to start a little bit with the why. So I thought uh, Jason did a good job of making the case for change. I'm going to expand on that a little bit, but before I think we can decide whether or not we need or why we need a club licensing program, I think first we need to understand why standards are important. So believe it or not, uh, there are actually organizations out there that are 100% committed to studying and developing and understanding standards. And here's a couple of quotes for those that uh, uh, that are involved in that, the European Community for Standardization. Standards provide people and organizations with a basis for mutual understanding. And the Standards Council of Canada, standards improve confidence in the products purchased by our consumers. So for me, there's a couple of important ideas in there that make the case for standards. So first of all, we have people and organizations which have a mutual understanding. It's fairly important. Another piece of it for all of us that's essential is it improves the confidence of our consumers. So for us in the soccer industry, our consumers are our parents and their children. So if they have improved confidence, that's a good thing. If you want to look at it from another perspective, think about what the world would be like if there were no standards. So obviously for us, our product is soccer. So I think fairly certainly we want soccer to work as our customers expect it to. So when someone sides their child up for soccer, I think they have a certain belief about what they're going to get and we want to be able to fulfill that. We want to provide a product that works as it's expected. Obviously we want to provide products, products that have quality. If we're providing an inferior product, they're going to look elsewhere for something that fills their needs. We want our products to be compatible and there's been a lot of talk about that this weekend which is fantastic because it informs a lot of our decision making and the things that we think about is by compatible, it needs to work with people's life. It needs to be something that provides them with what they need in a way that they can absorb it, in a way that they can receive it, and in a way that they can use it. So it needs to be compatible with their lifestyles, it needs to be compatible with school, it needs to be compatible with other soccer programs, other sports they might be involved in. And in extreme cases, and I think uh, we had a great example of that yesterday with the great work that uh, Wayne and Sheldon and Mark are doing, we want to make sure that there isn't a danger. We want to make sure that it's a safe environment for our people to participate in. So for the same reasons that society needs standards, I think personally soccer needs standards and based on the number of people in the room here, I hope that you'll agree with us. The good thing is there are standards in our game. There's some great work going on in BC. They've started a charter program. Manitoba has a charter program. New Brunswick have gone so far as they actually have standards for clubs built right into their bylaws. So it's a condition of your membership with New Brunswick soccer, you need to be able to meet a certain set of standards. And Saskatchewan, where, uh, where I live and where I've spent the last uh, eight years working, we've got a little bit of a, uh, of a charter program going on as well. I would say Ontario, that's the model. Club excellence program in terms of standards across the board. We saw some great examples on Friday night of people receiving their plaques. Great round of applause due to all of you. It's great work to meet some high standards. It's a model for the rest of the country to look at. And if I, my math works, I think there's 57 organizations right now that are recognized at one of the three levels of the uh, Club Excellence Program. The question that I have to you, and we'll come back to this later, is what about the others? And I know a lot of you, you'll see your logos up there, are probably representatives of the clubs that are in those environments and are meeting standards because you're here. 
But again, we'll come back to it later on. What about the others? So an understanding of standards are important and wanting to raise the game right across the country. As Jason said a year ago, we started work on a project uh, to develop a national club licensing program. And what we did at the beginning is we looked at all of those programs across the country. We looked at a number of different programs around the world. We boiled down all the data. We squeezed it all together. We ended up with a big, long list of things that we could consider for clubs. And then we spent some time thinking about it and talking to people and sharing ideas. And we realized that there's no solution that's going to work right across the country. There's no international solution that we can import and impose on our clubs because we're a little bit different. So. We created a set of goals. This is what we're trying to achieve with our club licensing program. First of all, we want to set clearly defined standards and expectations for clubs. So I think we've established already why we think standards are important. We want it to be clear for all of you what we expect of you. It's really difficult to evaluate someone when they don't know what's expected. We want to change, drive change in the soccer system. I love that uh, car racing video there. It shows the world has changed. It's time for us to be able to change too, and I think that's been reinforced by a number of speakers that are a lot more qualified than I am to be able to tell you why change is important. Other thing we want to do is recognize excellence in the soccer community. As we said Friday night, we recognized excellence. We know there's great work going on right across this country. We want to be able to recognize that. We want to be able to hold your hands up and say, look, here's a club that's doing a really good job. What can the rest of us learn from you? And finally, we want to raise the level of all soccer organizations throughout Canada. So as I said, what about the others? 57 that we've met those standards, we want all of them to go up because when the tide goes up, so do all the boats. And for me in our soccer world, in that analogy, the boats are the level of the players and the level of the coaches. So if our organizations get better, those that are a part of those organizations will get better too. So I'm going to hijack your presentation. Like I said <laughs> that didn't take long. So... <laughs> Listen, what you don't know is that in my last technical committee meeting, he was an hour and a half over time. Completely burned my presentation. Not sure it was two so hours. So I own one. <laughs> um, club. What's a club? What's a club? You know where I'm going with this, right? So I've made no secret about the fact that part of my mandate is to unify the game. Every soccer organization, I don't care what your business status is, whether you're a registered nonprofit or a society in British Columbia, or if you're a private soccer organization. I don't care. You deliver a soccer program that's trying to help kids fall in love with the game and stay involved in the game forever, I want to work with you. Right? We want to work with you. One of the reasons I hired Dave is because they were the first province to recognize nonprofit organizations and private soccer organizations as equals. They are called member organizations, and everyone has the same rights and responsibilities. Now, we didn't think member organization licensing program sounded very good, so we went with club licensing program. But our definition of a club is an organization that delivers a soccer program. Right? This is a political bomb that nobody wants to touch in this country. I've got both hands on it right now. I don't care. This is right for the game. We have to be bold. We have to do what's right for the game. The reason academies exist, private organizations, is because nonprofit community clubs don't deliver the service that they deliver. And there is clearly a need for it because they're proliferating across the country. We can't artificially restrict good organizations from existing. What we can do is use the same metrics, the same standards that we evaluate clubs by to evaluate academies. That's fair. And every football person in this country that I've talked to about this system and this approach. That's all they want. We want it to be fair, equal. So that's what we're working towards. And I've met with the academy group, and I've worked with Ontario Soccer, who are leading the charge on this. Through their board, this, the, the creation of the OASL, a two-year pilot, to see what an academy league will look like, we're working to try and rebuild relationships. Because we have a terrible habit in this country, in our sport, of throwing people away. And we can't do that. We're not good enough to throw anyone away. We need everyone in this room and everyone outside the room to work together. I've said this before, one of the huge ironies in this game is it's all about teamwork. If you want to be successful in soccer, you have to work as a team. But nobody in our country wants to work as a team because everyone else is rubbish. Right? We have that mentality. It exists at every level. Everyone else is rubbish. We're great. We're doing a great job. Everyone else is it's their fault. We can't do that anymore. 
When we did this, we called it a criteria dump. We took all of the standards from all of the existing club charter or club excellence programs across the country. We took the academy standards. We put it all into one spreadsheet. Dave did it. Criteria dump. 170 criteria. Guess how many were different for nonprofit soccer organizations and private soccer organizations? 170 criteria. Two. Two. That's it. And it had to do with their legal business status. That's it. Right? We can use the same criteria to evaluate both business models and get everybody on the bus working together. Okay, I'm going to sit down now. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. I didn't know we were going to go there right now, but <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so now we'll get into a little bit the how, and I think this is where what we're trying to build in Canada is a little bit unique. So what we decided uh, going in is the first thing that was important is for everyone to understand what their expectations are. So we wanted to define the characteristics and behaviors of soccer organizations in a series of different categories. So we recognize in this country we have organizations that are very complex, very professional, big multi-million dollar organizations that are function like businesses. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got organizations that are completely volunteer. They may consist of a couple of teams and a couple of key volunteers in that community that make soccer work. And again, we'll come back to what I said beginning at the beginning. What about the others? We want those guys in. Just because you're a small organization doesn't mean you're important. Jason comes from a small place. That organization helped get him started on his journey. How many people from small communities in all sports in this country get their start in their communities? They're just as important as those big clubs that help us get to the next level. The other thing we want to be able to do is define those positive behaviors and use them to stimulate change. So once we've decided what it is we want our organizations to be able to do, we want to be able to drive them towards that positive behavior. And we don't want to do that by whacking them overhead with a stick saying, do this, do this, do this. We want to be able to encourage them to do the right things. Because I honestly believe everybody in this room is here because we want to do the right things. Everyone involved in our game wants to do the right things. Sometimes we don't know what those right things are, and sometimes we have you know, conflicts in our minds about what's best for me versus what's best for my club versus what might be best for the players, as Jason did a good job of presenting. But generally speaking, we all want to do the right things. And what we're trying to do is define what those right things are and help you to be able to get there. And then the final piece of it, which for me is the most exciting about this whole project, and I'm going to touch on it a little bit later on, is the assessment of outcomes against expectations using a 360 appraisal. So instead of evaluating the inputs, do it, this goes up on the shelf and we don't actually change anything, what we're a lot more interested in is the back end. What are the things that we've done over this period of time against what our expectations might be and what the best principles and practices are? So as I started building the program, we had a lot of uh, animated discussions and ideas exchanged about what it was going to look like. And what we started to realize is it's a lot bigger than just creating classifications. So the classification piece is how we divide things up. We put them into different piles. But the challenge that came to us from some smart people is, well, once you've got them in different piles, so what? What do you do then? And it's really started to hit home that that's a part of the puzzle, is we want to be able to recognize what organizations are doing. But more importantly than that, if we want to make them all better, we've got to focus on developing them. So organizations don't get better on their own. It helps to set standards. It helps to set expectations for them to be able to work towards. But a lot of them don't have the resources or the ability to be able to get there. So what are we going to do to be able to help to develop those organizations? And finally, on the back end, as we said, the appraisal piece is really important. And it's appraising against the right things. And I'm going to come back to that later on. So to start us off with, with the classification piece, and again, this isn't unique. This is essentially how every licensing or charter program is built around the world. It's around five principles, so infrastructure, technical or sporting, administration, governance, financial, legal, and social responsibility. And the star there for social responsibility in our model, that really is exclusive to the professional clubs, and that's linked into the FIFA club licensing program and the CONCACAF club licensing program. The expectation that professional soccer organizations give back to the communities in which they operate. So we won't touch too much on that one because it's more for those professional organizations. As we said, we wanted to classify into a number of different uh, categories. And the reason I say a number 
is we also discovered that it's not always going to be the same in every area of the country. So we start off with our National Club license way out there to the left. It doesn't apply to too many people in that room because that's the area where we're sanctioning our professional and semi-professional clubs. And that's a requirement in order for those organizations to compete in the Canadian National Championships with the potential to move on to CONCACAF Champions League and eventually FIFA events later on. So that's way out on the far end. Next to that is our National Youth Club license, which is the work that we're doing with groups like the OPDL to be able to set the highest level of standards for organizations across our country. What we've decided is that the uh, area that we can do the next biggest impact is to create the bookend to that, which is down here at this side. So these are the standards for quality sport. And I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on this because I know there are OPDL groups in the room, but I know there's also organizations way out on the other end that don't aspire to be here. They're there to help kids in their community get a good start in the game, hopefully inspire them to fall in love, and then when they're ready and if they want that, pass them on to an organization that's more involved in these higher levels. So as we developed kind of those bookends to go around the club licensing program, we spent a lot of time working with different provinces and territories. And what we realized is an organization like Ontario that's been doing a club excellence program for 10 years has a number of clubs that are meeting different levels of criteria is quite different than an organization like Alberta that don't have a standards program whatsoever. So your state of readiness and the position that your clubs are in is very different. So what we need to do in this middle area in order to reflect our provincial differences, realities and readiness is work with our provinces to find something that works to go in between that National Youth Club license and the standards for quality sport, which we believe all organizations should be able to meet. So we'll spend uh, some time over the next little while working with Ontario Soccer, uh, using the Club Excellence Program, using some of the foundational or fundamental requirements that we've said are essential for different areas of the license so that we can create a staircase approach so that the gap between here and here isn't so large that it becomes insurmountable for organizations. And the other thing that we realized is that not every organization aspires to be here. There's lots of organizations out there that just want to be really, really good grassroots community-based organizations and do a good job for the kids in their community. And that's great. The better you can get within each area is just as good as driving organizations this way. So if we can have organizations that excel across all of these different areas, we're all going to be in a lot better shape. So I'm going to come back and spend a little bit of time on the standards for quality sport because I think that's something that's universal. That's something that we can all get behind and we can all understand. And whether you're a little tiny uh, organization in rural Saskatchewan where I live or you're one of the big organizations in the GTA here that uh, uh, can do a lot more and has a lot more capacity and a lot more requirements, I think personally and from the research that we've done and thankfully some smart people here presenting have had a lot of the same principles involved in their presentations. Parents when they sign their children up for soccer expect four things. They want it to be first of all safe and I think Sheldon and, and his team do a great job of hitting that home. We cannot compromise that. That's something that is non-negotiable. When children, when parents turn their children over to us, they have an expectation that they are being put in a safe environment and we need to do everything that we possibly can to make sure that that's the case. Second thing, we want to have fun. Fun doesn't necessarily mean we're laughing and joking. Fun can be different across uh, different areas of development, different areas of competition. But if you're not enjoying sport, you're going to leave. Number one reason kids play sport is that it's fun. Number one reason why kids leave sport, it's no longer fun. We want it to be accessible and inclusive. We want as many people, and I thought uh, our keynote this morning did a great job of saying that, we want a ball at every foot. In order to do that, we need to have a program that's accessible and inclusive. We need to be welcoming. We need to say, come on in. We want you to be part of our soccer family. And the more people that are a part of our soccer family, the better we're all going to be. We need to be developmentally appropriate. And I think there was some great talk about that over the course of the weekend, about what that means. I'm going to go into it in a little bit of detail, not too much. But we want to provide the service that the individuals want at the age that they're operating. And then the final piece of the puzzle, and obviously speaking to a member-based group, I think you would all appreciate that. You meet the expectations of membership. So that's what differentiates for me what we do, which is organized sport from kicking around in the park. We're safe, we're fun, we're accessible and inclusive, we're developmentally appropriate, and we meet some requirements of membership. There's some rules that govern the way that we deliver the game. So I'm going to go into those in a little bit more detail. Start off developmentally appropriate, and obviously Jason presented on the uh, 
LTPD earlier and the amount of, uh, of traction that that program has had over the last 10 to 12 years. So we want to make sure that the program that we provide to children is developmentally appropriate. We're not going over the top. We're not talking about you know, windows of trainability and all of these great scientific principles that most people that are involved in the game either don't care about or don't understand. We're talking about little things. The number of people on the field the size of the field, the types of activities we do with the children, the size of the ball, the length of the game, all these things that are within our control and we can understand. We also want to make sure that our coaches are trained. And not only are they trained, but they're trained appropriately for the people that they're coaching. And I'm sure some of you have seen presentations before about some of the great work that's going on in uh, coach education, but I think there's a, a principle that we work from. If you're going to coach Johnny, first of all, you need to understand soccer. Second of all, you need to understand Johnny. I think we do a decent job of equipping our coaches with understanding soccer. We don't necessarily really understand Johnny or Jill or Bobby or whoever it is from the age of three when we first start playing the game all the way up through young adulthood and into adulthood. It's different. Coaching a 15-year-old girl is different from coaching a 6-year-old boy. Coaching a 15-year-old girl is different from coaching a 25-year-old man. So there's a lot of differences we need to understand and we need to have coaches that understand both the groups that they're working with and the game. Safe, again, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but I think it's an expectation that we have from parents who trust us with their children to make sure that those children are safe. And, you know, there's, there's nothing that I can say that's anywhere near as powerful as the film that we watched yesterday. So uh, for me, if you can sit and watch that film and hear Sheldon's story and not say we need to do everything in our power to protect our kids that are in our care, then, you know, you, you may need to find something else to do with your life. Uh, so for me, that's, that's a non-negotiable. We want it to be fun. So we want our organizations to be committed to providing an enjoyable soccer experience for all of your participants, not just some. We want everybody to enjoy what they're doing. And we want the focus to be on long-term participation. And I'm going to come back to that when we talk about our appraisal metrics. But we're actually working with a, with a researcher out of George Washington University in the States who actually has a way to define fun. And the great thing is she did that research with soccer players in the U.S. And she actually has, I think there's something like 28 different indicators of what fun is. So a lot of us, the challenge is we say, we all say, yeah, we want our programs to be fun. We don't really know what that means. And we're working with some great researchers to be able to actually define what fun means and on the back end be able to measure it. So are we actually providing fun environments for our uh, young people to be a part of in order to keep them involved in sport? As I said, number one reason kids sign up, it's fun. Number one reason kids leave, it's not fun anymore. So let's do what we can to put fun back in sport. It's accessible, it's inclusive, and it's welcoming. So as we all know, sport can be a refuge for people, but they need to get into sport. If they can't access it, if they don't know how, if the barriers are too high, if the level of engagement or the entry level to be able to get into programs is too high, they won't join up. And if they join, don't join up, it can't be fun. We can't do all of those great things and provide all of those great supports and create all of those great people that soccer does. So for me, soccer has always been the vehicle. What we're really trying to do is create great, create great people. If those great people go on to play for Canada, fantastic. But they might also go on to be leaders in the corporate world. They might go on to be mayors of your local city. They might go on to be great parents who sign their kids up and become your next generation of great coaches. But they need to get in. If we don't let them get in, they cannot go on to be those great people. And they need to see themselves in your organization. We need to make sure that they're welcomed and everyone feels welcome. And I know, uh, obviously, in this market, having that conversation is a little bit different from what I live. But we need to make sure that people can get into the game. And then the final piece of the puzzle, and again, this is probably the, the part that's, uh, that's self-evident, is we need to meet the expectations of our members. We need to be a good corporate citizen. We need to play by the rules. We need to play nice in the sandbox. So for me, those are the standards of quality sport. And there's nothing in there, at least in my personal opinion, that even an organization as small as a couple of teams and a couple of really dedicated volunteers can't do. These aren't, you know, moving boulders. This isn't changing the world. This is just doing what we, I think we all know that we should be doing for our kids to be involved. So once we've classified the organizations, we've said, you know, this is the pile you fit in, this is the pile that you fit in. So what? Next step is to try to get them better. So what we mean by developing organizations is we want to guide our member organizations towards best practices and principles. And by we, I mean all of us. It's the collective. It's Canada Soccer with some of the work that we're doing to establish the club profiles that talk about our behaviors and characteristics. It's guides which go into a little bit more how-to 
in areas like governance, management operations, technical safety, accessibility, inclusiveness. It's creating tools and templates for those organizations that have resources and maybe just need a little bit of direction to be able to get across the finish line. And it's also about creating expertise and providing guidance. And that could be folks like myself and Jason. Ontario Soccer have done a great job of structuring their organization so that they can support you. They can help you. We all want to see you get better. And we're here to help. And the other final piece of the puzzle is we want to create a pool of people across the country that are there to help. So some organizations either don't have the capacity, don't have the time, so we need to be able to refer them to people that do have that knowledge and can help you because we all want soccer to get better. And the final piece of the puzzle, again, the one that I'm most excited about is the appraisal piece. So we want to evaluate the outcomes. And the way we want to do that, again, is a little bit unique, borrowing from the business community, the idea of a 360 appraisal. So we want to be able to provide you with some data I'm going to talk about that in more detail in a second. It's objective, tells you how you're doing, and eventually be able to establish a baseline and be able to set some, some metrics or some goals for, for people to strive towards in key areas. We want to have some elements of self-appraisal. So we want to know what you think. How do you think you're doing? What are the areas you want to get better? What are the areas you need help? What are the areas you think you do really well and you might be able to share with other people? because there's some great work being done in this room, there's some great practices done by clubs in this country, but oftentimes we get so focused on doing, we don't necessarily have the opportunity to share. So we want to know who's doing a great job and how can we use those people to help others do a great job. We want to have a bottom-up appraisal or a customer service appraisal. We want to know what your people in your club, your parents, your players, what they think of how you're doing. And hopefully that matches how you think you're doing, but oftentimes it, uh, draws your attention to some areas where you might want to do a little bit of work. The other piece of the puzzle is we want to do top down. How do your regions or your districts, how does your province, how do they think you're doing? Do they think that you're doing a good job? And then the final piece of the puzzle, which is a little bit unique, is we want to know what the people around you think you're doing, whether it's people within your districts, whether it's people that operate in the same competitive sphere as what you're playing in. We want to know that you're a good corporate citizen. You're playing nice in the sandbox. You're not a guy that's going to grab all the toys and go home when things don't go your way. Your coaches aren't sitting in the parking lot waiting for another organization's game to end so we can go up and recruit all the parents to bring them into our club. We want to develop that good. Happen, no, <laughs> I see a few giggles. I don't know if they're the ones in the parking lot or the one whose game's just finished. I, I hope it's the, uh, the latter. But we want to know. We want to know how you're doing. And that whole picture creates your report card about how well you're doing at this club. And I think for me, establishing the right criteria, the right performance indicators, and the right metrics is a key piece of the puzzle. And we're really focusing in, we're boiling it right down to the things, in our opinion at least, and those that we've worked with and those that we've talked with, with re that really matter. And I want to focus in a little bit right here in this section. So I think these, for me, are the things that really matter. We want to know, are you attracting players to the game? So if you're attracting players to the game, where are they coming from? Do you have first contact players? Are they players that are coming, that are playing with you for the first time and they're joining the game for the first time? Or are you attracting players from other organizations? Are they coming from other areas? And if they are coming from areas, how come? Other areas, how come? We want you to retain those players. That's the key. We bring in huge numbers at young ages. Unfortunately, by the time we get to older ages, those numbers have diminished to the point that we struggle to form teams. We struggle to create leagues as they get older. So we do a great job of attraction. We don't do a particularly good job of retention. And whereas Jason has presented, we do you know, one of the worst jobs, if not the worst job in the world, is on progression. So those players that do want more, can we send them on to professional environments? Can we send them into the Rex environment now that there is one in Ontario? Are they going on to play college and university? Can they play in League One? Where are those players going? At younger ages, if you are an organization that sits more in this standards for quality sport, can we push them up the pyramid if those players want to play in the OPDL? What's the pathway that we're creating for our players to be able to fulfill their dreams? And finally, are we transitioning our players? So are they becoming your next generation of coaches? Are they becoming referees? How many of them can we turn into board members, which is, are always so difficult to find? So are we engaging those athletes early? Are we valuing them? Are we giving them leadership roles and leadership opportunities with the intention of transitioning them eventually into big contributors within our club? Same thing with coaches. Are we attracting them? Are we retaining them? Are we developing them? And are we advancing them to higher levels of certification and licensing? For me, those are really are the key performance indicators. I think all of these things are performance indicators, but these are the ones that we really need to be able to zero in on. And we need to be able to provide all of our organizations from across the country a report card that says, you're really good at attracting players. You're really good at retaining players. You're excellent at progressing them to higher levels because your pathway works. And when they're done their playing careers, 
or even while they're still doing it, those kids come back and give back to your community because you've given them so much. So for me, those are the things that really matter in our sport. It's great that we have trophies and it's great that we crown champions, but this is what it's all about. And those are the things that we need to measure because that's what's going to drive that behavior towards those positive outcomes. So why would you want to get involved? Other than, at least in our opinion anyway, us thinking that it's the right thing, we want to be able to reward organizations that do a good job. Everybody likes a pat on the back. Everybody likes the little ceremony that we had on Friday where you get to have your, uh, your plaque, you get to shake a few hands and uh, go back and hang it up on your clubhouse door. It's nice. It's nice to be able to be rewarded for doing that job. It's nice to be recognized as well. It's nice to be able to say, look, I'm a national, nationally recognized club because I provide standards for quality sport. That way you can say to your parents, look, we're a quality sport provider. Come be with us. I can't speak for anyone else. Those guys on the, down the street, I don't know if they are or not, but I know I am. In crowded markets, it's an opportunity for differentiation. So we're all fighting for market share. We're all trying to do our very best to attract new people in. If we're able to use the fact that we're a quality sport provider to differentiate ourselves from those that aren't, that's a positive. And at the highest end, our access to competition. So our national youth uh, license organizations, they'll be a part of what right now is known as the OPDL. We're working very closely with Ontario Soccer to transition that into a national platform, a national player development program. Uh, and to be able to have access to that uh, level of competition, you need to be able to meet certain standards. So probably the big question on everybody's mind, I'm sure, when's it going to happen? So. We've been working on it for a year. We've got a big uh, couple of months coming up. So at the uh, Canada Soccer AMM, uh, which is our equivalent to an AGM, uh, the goal is to be able to present all of the information to our board of directors. Any areas that right, might require work in either bylaws or policies and procedures needs to get approved to be able to say, yep, yeah, we're going ahead and we're ready and uh, hoping to be able to have that done for May 2018. And then we need to get in front of people. It's not about just dropping a whole bunch of requirements on top of you and saying, here, go do this. Good luck. We want to be able to help people understand, like we're doing today, why we're doing it and why it's important and what we're here to do to, do to help. So there'll be a, a period there where we're going to try to get in front of as many people as we possibly can, give uh, hopefully uh, nice polished presentations and uh, be able to help them to understand what we're trying to do and, and convince them to be able to get on board. And I don't think it's going to take a lot of convincing because I think we have good people that understand why we're trying to do this. This fall, we start the process of some, uh, hopefully, work to be able to recognize the groups that are already operational, particularly at the National Youth Club license, our OPDL group and our BCSPL group. And the reason we need to get that off the ground is because with that recognition comes an important piece of the puzzle, which is our MLS uh, domestic player status. So Canada Soccer have done a great job of working with MLS to create a situation where players who might get this wrong, Jason, before their 16th birthday? Yeah, so before the year of their 16th birthday, if they are playing youth soccer in a Canada Soccer approved youth organization, which we've linked to the National Youth Club license, if you're in that organization before the year of your 16th birthday and you go on to university and you sign a contract in MLS as your first professional contract or in the USL because it's an affiliated league, you'll be considered a domestic player league-wide. Right now, Canadians are only domestic players in Canada. It's a huge impingement on our professional playing opportunities for our players. Um, Tony's here, obviously, he was very heavily involved in, in, in this genesis. And our kids got to play pro. If they're not playing first team, they shouldn't even be in consideration for an international side because they've got to be playing professional soccer. So we're trying to get this done as quickly as is responsible because I don't want the 2003 birth year to miss out on that opportunity because it's that age group. And if it's only one kid in the whole country that gets the opportunity to play professional soccer because we do this, it's worth it. It's worth it. Okay. Yes? They already are. So the, the, and I don't like the term enforce. Um, I don't like the term mandate. It implies that we're trying to make you do something you don't want to do. Um, I, I believe in education. Um, so what you're, what, what's being referred to, there's, there's, um, there's costs involved in training and, develop, and developing young soccer players. And when a player from Canada 
goes overseas, and it has to be an overseas to another federation, there's two things. There's a training and compensation fee, and there's also a solidarity payment. Um, in many ways, people argue that the training and compensation fee shouldn't be applicable because the parents are actually the ones paying the full cost. In our country, it's a user pay system. In other countries, a lot of the clubs will bear the cost of developing the players themselves with a view as a business model to eventually having them go overseas to get that money come back in. And that's essentially the academy model at the professional club level. Um, so the training compensation doesn't happen that often. It can happen. But the solidarity payment is absolutely applicable. So if you have a player from your club who's gone overseas to play professional soccer, you need to understand those rules and regulations. And Canada Does soccer... That, that no, it doesn't. Unless if they're going cross-border... Well, there's, a, there's actually a, a number of court cases in the U.S. right now where youth clubs in the United States are arguing that they should be getting that training compensation. Um, I wouldn't, and I'm not a lawyer, and I wouldn't want to speculate on, on how that's going to go. Um, but I do know that there have been Canadian players who have received that. I was one of them. When I, when I went overseas and eventually had a transfer from Darlington to Dundee United, the Montreal Impact got a percentage of my transfer fee uh, when, I, when I left. Um, Daniel Henry is another example of a player who's gone overseas and his youth club received a, a percentage of that. The recreational players are often subsidized in the overseas that go to develop that player. And there's no money back that goes to the organization to reinvest in that grassroots to keep producing those players, which I would argue then you should get something for the training team because it's not really being paid for by the parent of the player that developed. Yeah, I'm, again, I'm not a lawyer, and I wouldn't want to speculate on, on how a judge or a jury might rule on that. But um, the reality is, and, and Don Garber used to say this to me all the time at TSN, because every time if you watch the broadcast and we interviewed him, I'd ask him the same question. When are Canadians going to be domestic players in MLS? And he would answer very diplomatically and very skillfully. But then off camera, uh, he'd have a few choice words for me. But he would always say, Jason, the reality is you don't produce players. Start producing players, and then we'll, then we'll have a discussion. But until such time as your development system is working and producing players, it's, a, it's really a moot point. You know? But I, I mean, I get your point, though. You know, it, it, around the world, and in those of you who are from other countries around the world, we'll all agree if you're, you've been involved in grassroots football there, it's a massive incentive for those clubs. Massive incentive. The European clubs don't want to play Canadian and American clubs. They'll say, I got five players over here at a kick. So, you know, if you want your fee, then. No, no, no club in the world will make that argument because they want the best players. They don't care where they're from. They just want the best players. And if the best player is Canadian, they'll pay whatever it takes to get them. Yeah, it's. There are some clubs in Europe that have done that. I'm aware of that. When I, when I transferred from Dundee United to Wigan, I had a bunch of clubs that told me that I had to quit playing international football or they wouldn't sign me because they didn't want to lose me during the course of the competitive season. I was 26 years old. I wasn't going to quit. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yes. Early in your presentation, you, you alluded to historically how we, how soccer has been measuring success. The, the U8 kid yep. team goes on to win some championship. Later in the presentation, and also, also you, you were indicating that one way to measure success is the number of people that get to move on to professional contracts, perhaps even national team kind of thing. In, in one of the slides that Dave presented, right in the middle, was the paradigm, I think, of what you were trying to accomplish, and I don't remember what slide it was. So my question to you is, is this your goal? That, that's the one. Yeah. Is this your goal, that you think the change can occur to measure success across the country this way, as opposed to, because the yep. other way, instant yep. gratification. Yeah, it is. We, this way, the gratification doesn't come until... Yeah. And, and I will say that measuring success by the number of people that get to professional teams, that gratification is way too far away. Yeah, and that's why it's only one of four metrics. 
So what's the only metric we have in youth soccer right now? The only metric that we have to assess an organization's competency? No, nope, it's not retention. What's the only metric? Winning. Winning. It's the only metric, right? The only one. So as Dave's mentioned a few times, we've talked to some really smart people about this. It's a lot smarter than Dave and I. Um, one of them was Joe Baker uh, at York University and Nick Waddy, University uh, UOIT. I sat down and I explained to them what we're trying to do and how we're trying to change the metrics that parents use to evaluate the programs that they register their kids in. Because right now, I've, and I've talked to loads of parents, I always ask them, how do you pick a club for your kid to register at? How do you know? Well, it's word of mouth. How do you know the person's telling you the truth? <laughs> right? Do you pick a doctor? Imagine, like and Dave made the point, imagine if we didn't have standards. Imagine if there was no medical school. Right? And anybody could hang out a shingle that said doctor such and such. How would you choose? Word of mouth? <laughs> w would you really risk your life on that? And this is the thing, and, and I think, again, Dave said it best. It hit home watching Sheldon's presentation. You know, Our kids are the most important thing in the world to us. And yet, we're not doing the right things to protect them, to give them a safe environment, a fun experience, and let them fall in love with sport. And all we care about is that, you know, under eight, super elite, pre-prospect, world championship trophy. And that's not what, what matters. These things, when I talk to Nick Waddy and, and Joe Baker about this, if you don't know who they are, Joe Baker's a skill acquisition expert and very well published, very well regarded around the world on skill acquisition. And I told him about this and I told him about how we're trying to change and I'll talk a little bit more about this. Attraction is two things, okay? The first is how many kids come to your, uh, your club, your organization for the first time. They've never played soccer before, right? That gives us a picture of your club. How many are you attracting to the game? Another part of attraction is how many kids come to your club from another club? And if that number is skewed in one way or another, that gives us information that we never had before. Maybe you're just doing a great job of putting your coaches in the car park of other clubs and recruiting players, right? If, yeah, if that number is off the charts in one way or another based on the national average, right? That's attraction. Retention is pretty simple. Who comes back from last year? John Club, Alberta soccer grassroots manager, great quote, I love this. He says, I never wanna be a, a kid's last coach. If I'm a kid's last coach, I failed because they fell out of love with soccer, right? So that retention is massive. Imagine if we could say nationally, nationally, the retention rate in soccer is 82%. Your club's at 95%. And we celebrate that. Your kids come back because they love soccer at your club. Right? That's what we have to start promoting. Progression, you're right, Leonard. It's a delayed one. But there is progression internally, hypothetically. Uh, and this has happened to clubs in the room. Toronto FC comes to you and says, you've got some great players, I want them to come into our academy. That is progression, right? At the end of their, element, or their, their high school career, how many of them go on to play at the post-secondary level, either in Canada or the United States, right? I see all of you promoting that at your clubs, that you're doing that, that's progression. That's getting your kids to another level of the game. How many are going from in your club all the way up through to your senior team, your, le your League One team? How many are homegrown? That is progression. So it can be instantaneous, but it can be obviously delayed as well. The transition piece is interesting because we want people to stay involved in the game. The reality is 0.02% of them go on to play professionally. That's not very good odds. So we want those players to stay engaged in the game, either as coaches, as administrators, as volunteers, as referees, right? We need referees. If we don't have them, we don't have a game, right? So we want to transition people. But the key to all of this is the data. We need the data. And once we have it and we can start analyzing it, now we can change the metrics by which parents use to evaluate your program. If the satisfaction rate on the surveys that we do of your customers are off the charts better than the national average, parents know that's a great club. They do a great job. The kids love it there. The parents love it there. I want to go there. You know the number one reason people choose a club for their kid? Take a guess. Your friends go there. 
Distance. Number one reason, it's close, <laughs> right? We've got to be better than that. We've got to give parents the option to choose what the best environment is for their child. And that's not to say we want to drive everyone to the National Youth Club license holders because I know some of you in the room qualify for that. And I know some of you in the room that qualify for that are over capacity in terms of your programming right now. You don't have the fields to be able to expand and bring in more players, right? You need help to do the best job possible for the players that you do have, right? So when I told Nick Waddy and, and, and Joe Baker about this, this is what they said to me. They said, wow, that's ambitious. <laughs> I said, yeah, it is. I know, thanks, thanks for telling what's what's next? Water is wet? <laughs> um, it's ambitious, it is ambitious. So he said, you know what? He said, if you can pull this off, not only are you gonna change youth soccer in this country, you're gonna change youth sport in this country. Because the culture that exists in our country, that win, 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 where does it come from? Right? It comes from other sports, it comes from our culture, it's part of our culture, right? Younger specialization, that's part of our culture. But if we change the metrics by which we evaluate competency, we start to change that culture, we own that culture. We put it in the right direction of where we want it to go. Great question, Leonard. Any other questions? Yes? Um, the, the best country in the world, and this came directly from the CONCACAF president, Victor Montagliani, who's the chair of the stakeholders committee at FIFA. The stakeholders committee has representatives from the Bundesliga, uh, the Premier League, La Liga, like the top five leagues in Europe, uh, La, La Liga, uh, Real Madrid, Paris Saint-Germain, Arsenal, like all the top clubs and, and, and federations in the world. And he said this to me, we talked about this, he said, uh, so I asked him, I said, who should we be looking at? Who should we be talking to? Who should we be modeling on? And he said, you know, I, I speak to these people individually and independently. They all say it. I say to them, who's figured it out? And they say, Germany. I said, why? Because they work as one for their country. They work for Germany. They don't have the, the, the regional branches disagreeing and arguing against the DFB. So in the regions, they all work to produce players for Germany. In the districts within those regions, they all work to produce players for Germany. At the grassroots level, they all work towards producing players for Germany. They have an intricate uh, system of, of regionalized development centers. They commit to identifying every single player by the age of 11, but they don't start till they're 10. They don't select the best eight-year-olds to win the super elite pre-prospect championship. They don't care. They want their kids to play the game and fall in love with it. But they commit to scouting every single one of their players by the age of 11. And then they stream the best into the best environments. But they all work together for Germany. It's a huge, huge task. I have one follow-up. Yes. We're almost down. You're looking at the club. What about the other districts? How many districts here run programs? One. One. Not many, right? How many regions run programs? Where do, where do kids spend the bulk of their time? Which, with, with which organization in the, in the chain? Club, district, region, province, clubs. That's where they spend their time. So that for us was the logical place to start. In, in a lot of ways, other provinces have better systems than what we have here. If you're familiar with the Quebec system, the Sportitude program, where kids have their sporting experience and it's a multi-sport experience so it has multiple uh, different sports involved kids get to go to school and part of their school day is training for soccer right We'd, i'd love to have that across the country that would be fantastic but we don't have that in canada across the country we'll have it in one province right so the reality is our kids spend the most of their time with their clubs so that's where we felt it was the right place to start are we going to evolve and create programs um, at a provincial level, at a regional level, possibly, possibly. We have a new men's head coach. One of his tasks, John Herman, is to come in and create a system for us to start producing more than 0.02% of professional players. I can't say what that's gonna look like right now because that work is ongoing, uh, but the future could look different than it looks right now. But for me, for Dave, for us, 
the club piece is vitally important. Okay? Someone else? Yes, Rick. Yes. Which obviously makes the pathway clearer for those players. Yep. How do you see it? Yeah, I mean, affiliation can be a good thing for sure. Um, anybody from London here? London? London people? Glencoe Minor Soccer Club? Do yeah. you think that's a Category 1 organization? Glencoe's like a town of 2,200 people. I didn't even live in Glencoe. I lived on a dirt road outside of Glencoe. That's how remote I was. Like, I'm the definition of a hillbilly, like a redneck. Um, Country bumpkin, I think one reporter called me one, one interview once. Um, I played soccer in Glencoe until I was 10. Co-ed, grassroots soccer, two years up with my brother. Loved it, great experience. Glencoe's never gonna be a national youth club license holder. But they have this. This is where they play a role. And this is where the challenge we've had across the country with any kind of a club charter or club licensing program is that people always assume it's about Determining who's better. It isn't about that. It's about getting everybody involved and letting them choose the level that's right for them. So we want Glencoe Minor Soccer to be the best quality sport experience that it can be. So that those kids in that community that live there have an opportunity to fall in love with the game. And if there's a formal agreement in place where they agree to have a partnership with London Youth, for example, yeah, we're going to send our best players to you if they want to go and play at that level. That's what I had to do as a kid. You know, and eventually I had to go in and then got selected into the provincial program. So there was more travel involved. But part of this is to try and improve the club level experience so that more kids stay involved for longer in the best environment possible. Right? And sometimes an affiliation, a formal agreement is required. I personally think that all that's required is that we be adults and work together to help our kids. You know. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. You know, once if you couldn't hear on the other side of the room, Melanie asked if, if once we have the data about who's retaining and, and whatnot, are we going to share best practices? Absolutely, absolutely. Like, listen, we're all in this together. <laughs> we really are. You know, we might not all agree on everything. Um, we might not like each other at times. Who knows? But uh, the reality is, you're all this. You know, Canada soccer is not me and Dave. It's everyone in this room. So it's our responsibility to be the distribution network. And part of the reason that we're doing some of the things we're doing, like the video curriculum that we've done, um, that we, we partnered with Ontario Soccer recently to do a great session. And, and some of you here in the room, uh, your kids were there. We did a previous one with you guys in Burlington. We want to showcase what you guys are doing, what the great coaches. And honestly, the, the one we had here in, in, uh, in Ontario with Ontario Soccer back on Family Day was brilliant. Like it was literally, we were standing there on the sideline, me and Dave Kelly, and it was like, imagine if you had all these coaches at one club. It's like the all-star team of grassroots coaches. You know, one of them was like doing the funky chicken with the little kids and it was hilarious, making a complete fool of himself. But brilliant, brilliant coaching. You know, we want to share those stories. We want to help every club across the country to be able to do that at their level, right? We have to get away from this idea that we are com competitors. We're not competitors. We compete against each other, but we're not competitors. We're colleagues. Schools are not competitors to see who can produce the smartest students. They're colleagues in the education of kids. We, soccer organizations in this country, are colleagues in the soccer education of our young children. Okay? Good. Yes? To switch back to the other slide. Which one? Uh, the last one we saw, the end of this. Execution, timing, or management. The one that I didn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> the one I didn't finish. <laughs> no, that's okay. No, no. Ask the question. It's it's all up there. No, it's good. Who's going to execute this? Is it going to be Canada Soccer or partnership with the province of the district? Timing. Is that a little bit too aggressive? Everyone says I'm a little bit too aggressive. So I'll answer the first part. Is it aggressive? Hell yeah, it's aggressive. I didn't take this job. I didn't leave a job in the media to take this job to do the status quo. I took this job to try and affect change. And change means we got to put our foot forward. And we got to make decisions and we got to commit to doing things. And, and yes, it's important. Why is it 2018? 
Because I don't want these kids, anyone, to miss out on that opportunity. I don't want them to have to fight like I had to fight and hang on with their fingernails at times to get that opportunity. If it's one kid, one kid, it's worth it. But if we go into it with the right mentality that we're going to try and open up opportunities for as many kids as possible, I think we can pull this off. The quality sport piece, like Dave said earlier, I think every organization that delivers a soccer program should be doing that as a minimum. If you're not doing those things, if you're not making your environment safe, fun, accessible and inclusive, developmentally appropriate, and you're a member in good standing, I think that's a big problem. Right? We've set the bar low enough so that everybody can get on that first step. Right? The National Youth Club license, yes, it's, it's, the standards are high. But a lot of your clubs are already doing these things. All of the OPDL groups right now are doing these things. Some of the academies that are on the outside of the OPDL are doing these things. We want to work to get everybody to the level that's appropriate for them. I think that's why, yeah, I think that's, that's one of the reasons, I mean, yes, it is aggressive, but one of the reasons why we think it's manageable for 2018 is because we know the OPDL and the BCSPL organizations are already doing these things. So it's not going to be an open application that anyone can come in at that point uh, because we know those organizations have been for, is it six years in BC? And six in BC. Four here? So we, we know those organizations are there, so that's the starting point. The quality stand, or standards for quality sport, that becomes more about self-declaration that we're able to do those things. And you know, the, in terms of the entire picture, all of the measurements, the report cards, that stuff won't be ready in 2018, but we want to be able to get those organizations into the pathway uh, and then kind of work with the new ones as we continue to move forward. In terms of who's going to do it, you're spot on. There, there's some elements that Canada Soccer has to do. The National Youth Club license, we have to be heavily involved in because it's our stamp that's going on top of it. We also need to work with our provinces. It's a big country. We can't do all of the assessments, all of the work, all of the uh, organization on our own. So it will be in partnership with our provinces. And then depending on the area, potentially districts as well. Uh, we've had a lot of great conversations in Quebec, which, uh, which Jason has mentioned. They have a model uh, where there's a lot of capacity at their regions. Their regions operate almost like uh, smaller provincial organizations. I know that's not the case anywhere else in the country. So for them, a regional implementation makes sense because they do have capacity and staff there. Uh, in some areas in Ontario, they have similar. Uh, most areas the district is more an administrator than it is uh, an organization with capacity to be able to do that assessment. So, Paul? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So he, like, are, are, there, are there things that are going to be added? Yeah, there are, for sure. You know, and, and one of them is, is, you know, we've been working with the provinces and the technical committee to define what a skill center program is. And obviously we're not here to talk about that today, but the reality is we want to be able to do the best job possible to open up opportunities for as many kids as possible in that U8 to U12, that sort of pre, those five pre-OPDL years, right? Because player development doesn't start at U13. It starts much younger than that. But we've built those guidelines and those principles off of the programs that the clubs in the OPDL are running right now, that the clubs in the BCSPL are running right now. We, we obviously want to change some of the things, but there's nothing in there that I think anyone would disagree with from a philosophical perspective. Uh, you know, players spend as much time as possible with a ball at their feet. Training is, is, is game-like or game-based. You know, we saw great examples of it uh, with Mark's session here. How it can look like the game, but it's not a game. Or how, you know, you can coach and work in that environment. How you can still get your coaching points across without intervening every 30 seconds. Um, things like uh, accessibility. Um, you're not going to have tryouts for a skill center program, right? Picking the best eight-year-olds to go and smash the next club's best eight-year-olds so you can crown yourself the super elite, pre-prospect, whatever champion, doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. So why are we operating programs that way? We don't want to do that. So I think for most of the clubs, if not all the clubs in the OPL right now, it's an evolution rather than a revolution. Right? We're not going to be asking you to do things that you'd be fundamentally opposed to. We're just going to ask you to try and work in a, in a, in a better way, and we'll support you in that process. What we're not going to do as well is we're not going to say to anybody, right, you're not doing that today, sorry, you don't get the license, sorry. We're going to put a timeline in place. This isn't about 
um, it's not about hierarchy or, or and, and, and I think classification, I don't even like that word because it almost has like a, a, like a class system. And, and if you're from the UK, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? If you're in the elite, you're in the elite. And nobody's getting in the elite except the elite. We don't want that. We want to be able to help clubs get to the level that they want to get to and support them along the way and put a timeline in place to help them get there. I think just okay. to add on that, Jason, the last, I didn't touch on it all in this presentation, but the last box here out, uh, my left, your right, the progress. So that would be the piece there, is down at the bottom there. So external against ex expectations, that would be if there are areas with existing organizations that are gaps, what's the action plan to be able to get there and how long is it going to take us to get there? So we're, we're in this together. It's a, it's a partnership. We're not here to say, here's a couple of X's in your report card, you know, get out, we don't need you. Next one in. That's, that's not the, it's not a, you know, in, out kind of thing. We, we want to work with everybody that wants to work with us to be able to raise the standard across the board. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know if people will complain if it's aggressive. I think people, it's because it's new, right? It's new and it's different. And cha like change is hard. It really is. Because there's always uncertainty attached to change. Well, what's going to happen? Are all our players going to leave? You know, when the OPDL was launched, think about all the clubs and the panic that went on. Oh, my God, if we're not in the league, all our whole club's going to collapse. Has that happened? No. It, it hasn't, Right? But it has helped the organizations in the OPDL, despite the fact that, yes, there have been teething pains. We knew that going in. We said on the Technical Advisory Committee way back when, we're not going to get this right. We're going to make mistakes. We need to be fluid. We need to change as we go. And that's the reality. But with a commitment to always helping the organizations get better. And I think every one of the organizations, certainly the ones that I've talked to, um, and maybe they're saying something different when I'm not around, but when I talk to them, they all say, it's helped us get better. You know, there needs to be a good relationship throughout. And this is where Dave and I spend a lot of time talking to people, trying to build relationships, building relationships with our provinces and helping them. Because I tell you what, the people in the room here from, the, from Ontario Soccer have done a magnificent job putting this event on this weekend. And they're working every single day. I always laugh when I get criticized or, or governing bodies get criticized for being incompetent or negligent or this or that or whatever. It's a joke. Walk a day in their shoes and see what it's actually like, you know? And unfortunately, none of those people are brave enough to show face here and actually say it in, in, in public. Um, sorry? You're welcome. No, listen, what you guys do, and, and I extend that to the clubs, the, the clubs, the districts, the provinces, our game doesn't exist without you people. It, it doesn't. Like, we, we have nothing. This doesn't exist. National teams don't exist. I've said before, uh, Every national team player starts in grassroots football. Every single one of them. How many are we losing because we're not giving them a great experience at the start and they drop out because they hate it? We know kids quit because it's not fun. So let's make it fun. Let's figure out how to make it fun. We hope this is going to be one step in, in that journey. Sorry. Well, Steph next. Steph next. <laughs> Yep. Um, in the OPDL team, we're a club that's working towards that, or an academy who's not in OPDL. Yep. What's that progression plan for us of, not to say that we're labeling, but, but the groups will get into that national level. Yep. Where do we, in that year-over-year -year transition, um, from Ontario's perspective and Canada, where, where does that movement come in? I hope it'll be 2019, so the idea being, and there's no reason with a province this size that already works on a three kind of leveled club excellence program, that there wouldn't be two levels in between kind of quality standards for sport and national youth license. So it'd be in that provincial level license one or two. And ideally, I think here there's enough volume in some areas in the country there isn't. In some areas of the country there isn't even a need for anything beyond quality sports standards. So for here it would be in those areas of provincial license one and two, and we'll work with on 
Ontario soccer. We've got some framework there, so it's now time for us to sit down and say, here's the things that we're thinking. You know, what are the things that exist already? What does this program need to look like in Ontario and how quickly can it get going? And I think here, based on the fact that they've been doing it for 10 years, there's no reason that it can't move quickly once we uh, agree on what those standards are. And, you know, having gone through that exercise of dealing with the wide list of criteria, I don't think there'll be anything in there that isn't already included. And if it is, it's things certainly that would be achievable by clubs that are, that are meeting those standards already. I think it's important, too, to see that the clubs that are meeting that level one or whatever it said are not national, mm -hmm. um, how we transition into that national program yeah, and back to that too, because yep. we want to make sure that our clubs are feeling that ability to get into that national yeah. stream because we're not currently OPL. Yeah. Yeah, and I think OPDL, I don't want to speak for, for Gabe, but I think they've done a fantastic job of creating that open system. Where it was at the beginning with the number of license holders versus where it is today is very different, and I think that allows organizations to aspire. It allows those that maybe weren't ready four years ago but are ready now to grow. Um, you know, we've got other organizations or other provinces that have adopted different systems that are a little more closed where, you know, there were eight license holders in year one. There's still eight now. So the incentive for organizations to aspire and grow, you know, maybe isn't quite as strong as it is here, where realistically, if you can meet the standards, Ontario Soccer have been great at accepting you in. The analogy that I like to use is, if our students are not getting grades that are good enough to get into university, the solution is not to restrict the number of good schools they can attend. The solution is to create better schools, to help work to create better schools. And that is only going to happen with an open and inclusive system. Sheldon. It's, it's the, you know, the most dangerous phrase in the world is we've always done it that way. You know? And that, that's what roots us in that status quo and, and we cling to it. If you've never been to uh, the, the Child Advocacy Center that Sheldon and Wayne have put together in, in Calgary and you're out there, please go and have a look around. I, Wayne took me there when, when I was out there last year. We went really early in the morning and honestly it scared the shit out of me. It really did. Um, the numbers of abuse cases that they see, it's just scary. And I've got kids, and I'm sure lo loads of you have kids. I came away, Wayne didn't see it, but I was like this. I was shaking. Because I just could imagine what, what would happen to my kid if, if, if they had to go through that experience. It was eerie. Um, and, and that, you know, again, what Sheldon says, well, that's not how we do things. Well, let's find a way to do them. And let's do it because our kids mean that much to us, right? And they've done that out there, and it's, it's fantastic. So 
Um, thanks, Sheldon and Wayne, uh, for all your hard work and for working with us. Absolutely. Absolutely. There was a question over here. Someone had? Yes. So, um, I, lo I love that Canada's soccer is putting in some standards. And we can all jump on board. It will bring each club, you know, that it will get that, much, that club that much better. But my question is, uh, what's happening on the field? What's Soccer Canada going to bring down to the coaches so that they can implement and find these players to get a better national team? Yeah, it's a great question. This all kind of ties together. I, I said at the start, I, I consider the club licensing program to be the glue that puts all of it together. So things like the player development program, which is going to be uh, a unification of all the national youth club holders in, across the country to bring all of those leagues under the guidance of Canada Soccer. And we'll work with Ontario Soccer here to implement that. It's going to be easier here, I'll be honest with you, than in any other province because Ontario Soccer was able to learn from the BCSPL and the mistakes that they made and was fluid and changed and, and is constantly evolving. Um, so that's one piece. The skill centers that I talked about earlier, that's another piece. The coach education piece for me is also probably one of the most crucial components of this. Because ultimately the people that spend the most time with the players are the coaches. And I spoke with the, the, the uh, head of coaching for the Belgian Federation uh, two weeks ago. And he said to me, and this was a brilliant, uh, brilliant piece of advice, he said, Jason, we had to work at this. Like the success we're having now, they got to number one in the world, tiny country of Belgium. They're now, I think, number five in the world. They got to that place because of the work they put into coach education. And he called it the coaching switch. And I said, what does that mean? He says, well, we worked at this and constantly through our coach education program, we educated coaches to understand that yes, soccer is a team sport but your job as a coach is to develop the individual. So when they stopped thinking about the team result and started thinking about the individual development, that's when the switch happened for them. Now all their coaches at grassroots, they think all about the individual, developing the individual, giving kids the time they need to grow and develop on their own time. You heard Mark's presentation, Reed's presentation about nonlinear pedagogy and how Kids don't all develop at the same rate. We as coaches have to understand that. It's my responsibility, our responsibility at Canada Soccer to put in, in place a coach education program that teaches those principles. And we're not there today. I, I can tell you that. We're not there today. We will be there in time. It's, it's going to take time, but we will be there for sure.
with the OSA. And that's branch change and are, have nothing to do with the OSA anymore. But the rules that are being implemented there, well, the academy is at a standard where you can play up and even down with the appropriate paperwork, yet our district, mandated by the OSA, and I'm wondering if this is coming from the, the, the Canada soccer as well, is we can't even have a player play up unless we fill out the paperwork. And if we can't get that player, then he's firmly on that team, he can't go back down, even to get a couple of starts. We're forced to go to the house league to locate a player that takes a week to process his book, get a uniform to him that's got to be a different number that's sold up now. These are not the same rules that we implemented on the academy side. You know, why, you know why a lot of the rules are in place? Because there's that many people trying to put the best eight-year-olds on a team together to go and smash the next town's best eight-year-olds and win a trophy. We, we use an adult competition model for youth soccer, which is outcome-based, not performance and experience-based. Right? We're not actually creating the right environment for kids to learn the game and fall in love with the game. So we have all these rules in place to stop people from gaming the system. Because that trophy at the end of the year, heaven forbid you play a kid down a year because that's what's developmentally appropriate. You're cheating. You want a better team so you can win that trophy. That's what we think. We need to change the way we think. We need to think about what the kids need and put in place a system that supports their development. And if that means that a 13-year-old plays with a group of 15-year-olds, great. You know, I was taller than Dave when I was 12. Um, you know, I was able to play at, a, at, a, at a, a higher level. When I was 15, I played with 18 year olds. When I was 16, I played with men. I signed as a pro. You know, Tony went through the same experience as a professional. You talk to any of the professional players, their pathway was different than what our system's pathway says it should be. But when we put standards in place, the reason we want to put standards in place is we want to be able to educate more coaches to understand these things. Right now, when there's no standards in place, it's a wild west. It really is. And, and you have no idea what you get. You could have a great coach, you could have an awful coach. You have no idea. At the very least, in the National Youth Club, the coaches that are working with our players will have an education in how to work with players. Whether they put that into practice is open for us to figure out. Hopefully, with enough people getting on board, buying into what, we're, what we're, we're, we're trying to do here, we'll work together as partners to develop the right environments for kids. But I, I get your frustration because I, I hear it across the country when I had a conver that conversation yesterday with, with my colleague. Well, the district won't let us do that. Why can't we just change the rules? Why can't we have a, an adult conversation and talk like equals? And, and we're not all equals. Everybody's got different experiences, different knowledge base in the game, right? But when we have a conversation about the future of the game in our country, we have to treat each other as equals. Everyone has to have a voice. That's why I started the, the presentation off with that video and the survey. Canada Soccer Forge Class U, go there if you haven't done it already. Have your voice, have your say. You have an opportunity to change the future of the game in our country. Let's work together. I mean, like, like I said, I, I think a lot of the rules are in place because we're still dealing with the remnants of an older system. And we have to change that. And it takes time. Like, honestly, if, if, I, if I had the power to snap my fingers and change everything, I'd have done it 18 months ago, the day after I started. I don't have that power. You know, the, the, the only way we're going to affect change is if we work with people and have conversations and answer tough questions and try and find solutions and try and find answers. I can't tell you that the district is, is bad because I don't know what district you're in or what the history is, but I guarantee you there was a reason they made those decisions and it was based on the best information they had at that time, you know, which is why the F1 video was in there. We have to evolve. We have to take in, you know, at snapshot along the way of where are we now and where do we want to go and is what we're doing right now going to help us get where we want to go? If it's not, we have to change. Yep. No, not going to mandate. Not going to mandate. You know, because a, a mandate says to me, I'm going to twist your arm behind your back until it breaks if you don't do what I tell you to do. I don't want to mandate things. I want to educate people that there's a better way to do this. And I want people to understand that we can do this together 
regardless of whether I think it's the right thing or Dave thinks it's the right thing, we collectively have to buy into it. Because if I mandate and you don't believe it, eventually you'll find a way to break the system. Somebody will, right? One question. Better make it a good one. <laughs> hey? You mentioned parents and parent education teams. And yeah. obviously, it's incumbent upon all of us in the room to educate parents constantly. But with this being a new a change, a, a brand new thing, what is Canada Soccer looking at in terms of parent education? Yeah. So, social media is pretty powerful, you know, good or bad. Um, but we're going to be producing a series of sort of videos and explanations of, of uh, what we're doing and why. Explaining why we need to do this. You know, n not necessarily a condensed version of this presentation, but it'll be me primarily, other people, John Herdman perhaps, Kenneth Heinemuller, uh, our, our leaders, technical leaders across the country, about why we need to do this and, and what the desired outcome is and how, yeah, you know what, we're going to have to work together to make this happen and make it a reality. So there's going to be information coming. Uh, Dave's created, uh, and we've been working on this for a, a pretty lengthy period of time, guides. I think Dave mentioned it in there. There are guides for governance, administration, technical infrastructure, that kind of thing. What um, our research has told us those different levels should look like at the, at the club level, right? So parents can uh, certainly have a big role to play in that as well, for sure. Okay, so we are pressed for time. I, I never like to butt up against lunch, so... Um, Thank you all for your cooperation, your discussion, your questions, uh, and all the work that you guys continue to do at the grassroots level. We need you. Um, we value your contribution, and we, we're here to help you guys get better and, and deliver great soccer programs for our kids. So thank you very much. <laughs>